Hello everyone, my name is Viktor Öhman, and in this video I'll be going over how I approached the set dressing of the village, which was not only the bulk of the work I did, but also the most fun. Set dressing is more nuanced than one might first think, as it requires some logical thinking regarding storytelling, the natural order of things, life cycle of plants, and how all of this interacts over time based on the surrounding areas. I'll be covering some feature overviews, useful tips and tricks, and some high-level insights into my mindset and workflow for projects like this. The way I like to approach set dressing is to split it up into different brush strokes, as I call it. Large, medium, and fine. The large strokes are the larger asset scenarios, like forests or cliffs, and larger key assets. The medium strokes are hand-placed foliage like shrubbery, stumps, boulders, etc. Whereas the fine strokes are grass, pebbles, ropes, cables, decals, and so on. The first broad stroke I'll do is to add some nature to the surrounding areas. And the quickest way to do this is to use procedural foliage volumes, or PFVs for short. My colleague Jacob Coidel made a great video covering how to set these up, and you can check it out by clicking the video link below. To get started, all you need to do is to enable procedural foliage volumes in the editor settings, then find the PFV in the Place Actor menu. Then drag a volume to the area you want to populate, scale it to the correct dimensions, and then select the preset you want to use from the content browser and plop it into the slot. All the presets used in this video are all part of the project that you can download for free from the marketplace. And once that's done, simply hit Resimulate and give it a second or two to work its magic. And there we go, we got a forest. I'll duplicate this volume and add a forest to this side as well. Then duplicate it once more, and select the sparse forest preset and re-simulate using that instead. It gives the forest a bit of a nicer fall off rather than an abrupt edge. And I'll do the same thing for the other side. Let's fill in the remaining areas with a different preset, the shrub field one. What I'm going for is a nice gradient fall off, both in terms of verticality and density. This is a mindset that I lean on quite extensively when creating environments. As the surrounding area is done pretty much and the house is feeling a lot more grounded, let's add some larger assets to begin telling a story. Who lives there? What does he do? Has he been away for an extended period of time? So let's say he's a middle-aged carpenter and a barrel maker who's been on a merchant trip for a couple weeks. This will let us use quite a large number of the available assets in the library, and it will also allow us to make the place feel a bit untidy due to his absence. So I'll start off by adding a bench or two around the house, and benches are great as they can really help the viewer visualize daily life and how the benches are used, by whom, and sort of create their own stories. It might sound silly, but it works. Practically, and they can be used to place other assets on as well, just like tables can. Next, seeing as he's a barrel maker, we'll add some trusty barrels here and there. I'm making sure to add some nice boards between the barrels here to add some structural integrity and some more visual fidelity to the assembly. And while I've got these planks handy, I might as well just add a little storage area here. Let's continue set dressing the front of the house. I'll grab this fantastic looking log pile from the content browser and place it in, in this little roofed off area while making sure it doesn't intersect too much with the structure itself. Something that was very common in ye olden days was a loading door or a landing on the second floor of houses on which goods could be lifted up to. I'll use some of these board assemblies that I just used to make a quick balcony of sorts. Here I'll place another barrel. And we'll return to this area in the next step. For good measure, let's go ahead and add a wheel and a wheelbarrow to give it that semi rundown look and to add some more round shapes to the relatively straight construction and to make it look as if the owner has made some makeshift repairs, etc. If we zoom out a bit and see how everything ties together with the nature around it, there's quite a stark contrast. Part of this will be fixed in the manual foliage pass later on, but Let's go ahead and add in some elements to show that this location also used to be part of the forest. A tried and true way of doing this is to add a couple of stumps and things like that. So let's go ahead and add one here and there around the forest and the vicinity around the house. 
Next, let's use the rock that's part of the forest's uh, procedural foliage volume and place one in a strategic location closer to the house, next to the road. The idea is to bring some select pieces of elements from the surrounding area into the house lot itself. Not only to help tie the areas together, but to help tell the story, as I just mentioned. When doing this, I'm also using a much larger rock assembly to make it look like the hill itself sits on a larger stone foundation. Alright, it's really getting there. The only thing missing now, before we move on to the next step, is to add the path leading up to the house. For this, I'll use a blueprint with a spline mesh. If you've downloaded the project, you'll find it in the content browser. And what you do is you simply drag and drop it into the world, and then alt drag from the control points to start shaping the path. I made sure to switch out the default road mesh to an improved one, which is also available for use in the project. I'll start the path a bit back out of the way of the camera and have it swoop up to the hill to the front of the house, leading up to this area, which is a main entrance and sort of the main working area. And there we go. Just one last thing before we move on to the medium strokes. Fences. Let's set up a perimeter around the house. Just like with the road, I have a spline-based blueprint here, which lets me place it using splines, and it randomizes which pieces to use, and it automatically places an end piece as well. Let's drag it around one side of the house, and then create a copy and have it go along the other side of the house. I'm also making sure to add some fencing along either side of the road leading up to the house. I'm making sure to add some regularities to the fencing to make them look a bit older and more rickety. Anything to avoid straight lines. So let's move on to the medium strokes. Now I'll add things like ropes, chains, smaller assets and so on. I'll start off by adding some boards to the path. It really helps break up the repetitiveness of the road and also add some more visual interest to storytelling. I'll grab a wooden beam and I'll sink it down into the mud here and there. Using planks and boards is a pretty common practice on muddy roads to help add traction for carts, people and cars, etc. Now that we have that done, let's add some ropes. Back in the day, people probably didn't put ropes everywhere, but it really helps add some verticality to the scene and to help break up the sky and surrounding areas and so on. Plus it's a really powerful compositional tool, as it's really efficient at guiding the eye and for framing. Similar to the road and the fence, I have a blueprint that Jacob set up for the project. I can place it using a spline, and it can be set to a closed loop as well, which is great if you want to make it look like it's been tied to something. So let's try it out here up by the balcony. It's set to a closed loop, and I'll duplicate it so that it looks like it's been wrapped around. I'll then make a copy of that and disable closed and pull it down to the ground. This makes it look like it's been the rope that's been used to hoist things up to the second floor or to the loft. Something that I like to do when set dressing and building environments is to kill straight lines. Straight lines are generally very unnatural, so when they do occur, they stand out like a sore thumb. And there are many ways to do this. For things like fences, you can hang a rope on it, put a saddle on top of it, break the lines with a hand tool like a scythe, and so on. What I'm doing here is I'm adding some stone foundation using a couple of different assets. Anything to help get rid of the laser straight lines we're seeing. Even for modern urban or sci-fi environments, this is a good practice, as it just screams CG whenever there are pixel perfect lines. Let's go back to the storytelling for a bit. I want to grab some tools and smaller assets and props because what I want to do is create a couple of work sites where the owner tends to sit down to whittle, repair stuff and so on. So I'll place a large stump with an axe jammed into it over there. I'll hang a chain on the wall, place some tools and some other small assets on the benches along with some boxes with you know spilled potatoes etc because it's these little things that really help sell the environment as a living, breathing space. And all these details let the viewer and the player make up their own stories in their heads and fill in the blanks. I'll also add a ladder. And fun, fun fact, this ladder was actually created using this asset you're seeing on the screen right now by cutting it up a bit in Maya. Also, let's board up a door and a window. 
Let's say this guy is really paranoid and really don't want people to get into his house. Once again, these things tell stories. Why did he board it up? Did someone else board it up for him? Did he die on his travels and is this place abandoned? And it's not only for telling stories, it also helps break up lines and adds additional depth to a relatively flat surface. Alright, time for the most fun part of the set dressing process. The fine strokes. And in this section we'll literally be doing fine strokes. And with that segue, let's open up the foliage painter. I want to add some vegetation around the house, not only to help tie the house together with the surrounding area more, but to tie all the assets themselves together with the ground at the intersection points. So let's start off by adding some foliage that we'll be using, like grass. Also, let's make sure to include the withered and dead versions of the foliage as well. I'll get to that point in a bit. To enable foliage for painting, just hit the check mark at the top of the square, then you can set the density, the scale and other parameters. Then it's just a matter of painting. I'll also include a withered fern that I'll use here and there to help bring up the density a bit. The first areas I'll paint are around the house and I'm using a rather dense stroke here with multiple grass types included. I'm doing a very broad stroke and they're imprecise and this is because the areas that I'm painting are wild grown and aren't kept tidy by human hands. So I'm going for a more natural chaotic look. I'm also making sure to overlap into the PFV areas a bit, again, to help tie things together. The next foliage pass I'll do is with finer, smaller and more precise grass tufts. I'll focus on placing these around the intersection points, around the road planks, around the house, fences and so on. Pretty much everywhere things meet the ground I'll place a clump of grass. And the reason for this is twofold. First of all, it makes sense biologically and naturally. Plants usually like water and less wind, and next to an object it's usually less windy and more shade, which in turn means there's more moisture. Secondly, it simply looks good to break those lines and intersections. I know I keep going on about killing straight lines, but I really can't stress it enough. It's so important. Let's find some branches and scatter them around the edges of the road and the house lot. It really helps add some more depth to the relatively flat road, plus it brings some of the nature into the man-made area. And now I'll add in some rocks, and here you'll see another example of gradients and fall off. I'll start off with larger, less dense rock strokes, followed by smaller but more dense strokes around them. The reasoning here is that smaller rocks scatter more easily, which means they'll reach further into the trodden areas whereas the larger ones stay more in place. One asset that I loved using in this project is a dead broom brush. They look almost like small pieces of hay or sawdust, and I used them quite extensively on the ground. Not only to help add some additional detail to the ground, but to help tie everything together on the ground. Plus, it was a common practice to spread things like this on the ground to help bind moisture and make it less wet and slippery. I might have overdone it, but I think it looks great. I'm making sure to mainly use it around the house and along the paths and the roads. As much as this might seem like a linear workflow, there's still very much an iterative nature to it. And at this stage it's a good idea to zoom out to get a bird's eye view of the scene and to dive in where it's needed to refine and tweak. I'm noticing the ground is looking a bit lackluster, so I decided to go in and add some additional, more worn down looking plank assemblies there. And here's another example of falloffs and gradients. Notice how the entire scene consists of them. Forests leads to sparse forests, which in turn leads to shrubbery fields and then grass. The house leads to smaller assets around it, with even smaller assets on and around them. So let's take it even one step further by adding even finer and smaller grass leading from the larger grass and into the house lot itself. And as a final step I'll sprinkle in some taller, almost wheat looking plants in a few select spots to add some height variation. And there we go. I really hope you learned something from this video. If you have any questions please drop them in the comment section below. And make sure to check out the project itself, which is available for free on the Unreal Marketplace. Thank you so much for watching, 
and I'll see you next time.